Okay. Um, I want to go through some of the math of the lab we're going to be doing here, which is using data from decays of radioactive isotopes to determine the half-life of those isotopes. And I'll present some of the mathematics of it here. One thing that's a key is that when you have a radioactive nucleus, there is no predicting ahead of time when that particular nucleus is going to decay. It might decay in the next microsecond. It might decay 50 years from now. You can't know ahead of time when it will decay. Similarly, uh, when you flip a coin, there's no telling ahead of time whether that coin is going to come up heads or tails, unless it happens to be what's called a weighted coin. It's kind of a, a dishonest coin, I guess. Um, however, if you have large numbers of radioactive isotopes or radioactive nuclei of a particular type, they will all they'll behave collectively in a fairly predictable way. And similar to that is if you've got a 55 gallon drum full of pennies, and you dump that 55 gallon drum onto a gym floor and then you have somebody go through and count how many of those pennies are heads and how many are tails, they will get just about 50% every time of those pennies will come up heads or tails. And so in, in large numbers, things work out pretty well. Now, I've got something here. Um, this is about a gram of table salt. And there's not very much uh, table salt in here. If you were patient enough, you could probably work under a microscope and actually count all those things, although you'd probably go crazy doing it. There's quite a few. But uh, anyway, that's about a gram of table salt. Uh, that's as fine as I could measure um, on my home scale, it only it goes to the nearest gram. So it could be anywhere between 0.51 grams and 1.49 grams, and it'd still tell me that. But um, anyway, let's imagine instead that we have a millionth of a gram of some radioactive isotope. So that means one times 10 to the minus sixth grams is what we have. Okay, well, how many would we have? How many radioactive nuclei would we have? For an isotope, let's pick polonium-210. Okay, polonium-210 is an isotope of polonium that happens to be radioactive. It decays to lead. Um, it has a combined total of 210 protons and neutrons in its nucleus. And so, uh, it's actually got a molar weight of about 210. And I'm not worried about super precision here. But let's imagine if you had a millionth of a gram of polonium-210, how many nuclei would you have? Well, if you've taken chemistry, you'll know how to do this. Um, one mole of polonium-210 would have a mass of 210 grams. So I'll take one mole divided by 210 grams. And that product will tell me how many moles I happen to have. But you happen to have 6.02 times 10 to the is it 23rd um, atoms per mole. I think that's right. And how many would you get? Well, let's see. If I called that 602 times 10 to the 21st, 600 divided by 210 is about 3. And I'm not worried about big precision here. That's about 3 times 10 to the 21st times that. I would have about uh, 3 times 10 to the 15th atoms of polonium-210. So a millionth of a gram and you'd have that many atoms. Okay, you're not gonna have that many pennies in a 55 gallon drum, but you will have a whole lot of atoms in a tiny sample 
of polonium-210. And it's enough so that the well-behaved statistical behavior of it is going to show up. Now, here's one of the things that shows up in that well-behaved well sample. And that is that if we let n equal the number of nuclei, and these nuclei have electrons, so we could call them atoms as well. So okay. well, dn dt is going to be the number of nuclei that decay per unit time. And turns out that if you have twice as many nuclei, you have twice as many of them decaying per unit time. And this is especially true when you've got large numbers of nuclei, which it doesn't take very much to have a large number of them. We could have gone to a billionth of a gram and we'd still have a three billion atoms if we'd done that. So uh, a billionth, no, we could have gone to a trillionth of a gram, and we'd still have three trillion of those things. So that's something you can do. But anyway, dn dt ends up being proportional to the number of nuclei that you happen to have. And so that's something that happens on this thing. Now, this happens to be something called a differential equation, and uh, it's a simple one that those of you in second quarter calculus would be able to solve this shortly after, well, not too far into the calculus course, if you know that you can pull a stunt here, which is called separating the variables. You multiply out from underneath by dt, and you would get uh, dn is equal to c n dt. C is just some constant. Okay, that's going to depend on properties of the nuclei that you happen to have. Divide both sides by n, and you'd get dn over n is equal to c dt. And something you'd learn to do in second quarter calculus is integrate. And you can integrate both sides of this equation. Now, on the right side, I want to integrate it from some time that I'll call zero. I can do that, OK, to some later time t. And on the left side, I'm going to, my limits of integration will be the number of nuclei I have at time zero, which I don't really care how many I have at time zero. I'll just call that n sub zero. Then I'll integrate to how many I'll have at time t, which I'll just call capital N of t. And integrating the left side, dn over n is the natural log. So I'll end up with the natural log of n evaluated at n sub zero and capital N, which ends up being the natural log, whoops, n of t of in of whoops of t keep forgetting that minus natural log of n sub zero which ends up equaling the natural log of n of t divided by n sub zero okay that takes care of the left side what does the right side turn into well the constant comes outside the integral and you have integral from 0 to t of dt, which just ends up equaling ct. So what I get down here is that the natural log of n of t divided by n sub 0 is going to equal ct. OK. Now, what I want to know is what is n going to be at a particular time. So I'm actually going to go forward on this, and then I'm going to go backwards on it later. Um, if you exponentiate both sides, so 
e to the right side, e to the left side, you'll end up with something that looks like this. You'll get n of t over n naught is equal to e to the ct. And then you'll have n of t is equal to the original number you had times e to the ct. And so that's the solution to the differential equation. It's the, the number of nuclei you have as a function of time. Now it turns out that because this is decaying, C ends up being a negative number. And um, for, I don't know, historical reasons or just be, it's customary in nuclear physics or something, the C, we just call it minus lambda. And lambda is a constant that uh, depends on the type of nuclei you happen to have. And with that, you get n of t equals n naught e to the minus lambda t. Okay. Well, if you were to graph this as a function of time, you'd get a curve that you saw last quarter in that one lab where I had you graph this data, and it's an exponential decay curve. It drops down sort of like this is what it looks like. And I may not have gotten that exactly right, but it's basically that's the behavior of it. But what we want, we want to know, figure out what lambda is, because hidden in there is the information on the half-life of the nucleus, for instance. And well, I'll show you how you can get that. Um, if we let T be one half-life of this isotope. That's the time that it takes to drop from an initial value down to one half of that initial value. This would be n as a function of t here. This would be the half-life here. Okay. You have exactly half as much as you did to start with. Okay, So if this is n naught up here, right there, then from the characteristics of this curve, we might be able to figure out what the half-life is if we knew what lambda happened to be. Now, it turns out to be pretty easy to figure out. After one half-life, the number you will have, n of t sub one half, will equal one half of what you started with. Well, that would be n naught e to the minus lambda times t sub one half, where t sub one half is the half-life of this thing. Okay, you can play around with this thing. Um, there's an n naught on each side, so you can divide that out. You get one half equals e to the minus lambda t sub one half. If you take the natural log of both sides, um, natural log of one half with a little bit of logarithmic trickery ends up being minus the natural log of two. And that'll be minus lambda t sub one half or the half life is gonna be natural log of two divided by lambda. So, if we can figure out that term lambda, we can figure out the half-life from the data that we have. Well, what can we do? I'll show you what we'll do. We're going to back up a step. And we went to the trouble of exponentiating a previous equation to get this. I'm going to take the natural log of both sides of this equation. And I'll have this natural log of n of t will equal the natural log of that n naught e to the minus lambda t. Now inside that parentheses I've got a product. The, pro the log of a product is the product of the logs, so I'll end up with natural log of n naught plus natural log of 
e to the minus lambda t. The natural log of e to the minus lambda t is just lambda t. You may have to do a little review of your logarithm stuff, but the natural log of n of t is equal to the natural log of n naught minus lambda t. If we make a graph of the natural log of the counts that we're getting as a function of time, the slope of that graph will be lambda. Now, the slope of that graph is going to have units of inverse time. Okay, this thing's dimensionless. This is dimensionless. It's just a number of counts. And so this has to be dimensionless. Actually, the argument of an exponential function has to be dimensionless. And so since this has units of time, and the time is whatever, um, I think on our data, it's days is what the time happens to be. This will end up being inverse days. And the half-life then, t sub 1 half, is going to equal the natural log divided by lambda. Now, when you make a graph of this, and I'm going to have you make the graph in Excel, you'll have some initial count up here. And your data points are going to fall along a line. And it'll be a reasonably good line when you see this thing. Although uh, something that I want you to do is, in your data, ignore the data after the number of counts per minute has dropped below 100. And the reason for that is that the background counts are about 15 counts per minute. And once you get below 100, those background counts are a fairly significant portion of it. And so your data may not be such a nice, smooth exponential curve anymore. Um, it could be start being dominated by uh, other radiation, not the sample that you're working with instead. But this is how you're going to do it. There's a handout that, that goes through the procedure that I want you to do except the handout was assuming you're doing it by hand. I want you to make the graphs in Microsoft Excel. So this will be T in probably days. And then N is just a dimensionless quantity. quantity. And we don't care what the intercept of this thing happens to be. All we're after is the slope of this graph. So let me show you how you might do that. I need to uh, open up the data in Microsoft Excel, and I don't know when I had it open last. Uh, let's see. And once I find this, I'll bring you back here. Um, browse network. I should have had this open ahead of time. Okay, I'm getting close. Physics, uh, radioactive decay. This is for the second day of the lab. OK. Um, oh, really? Let's see, I need to change my share here and show the Excel file. OK. Should be filming this now with the Excel file. And uh, got a whole bunch of um, data here. Let's see, I colored some brown down here. This is where the number of counts per minute drops below 100. So I'm not going to use that data. And uh, I'm only going to include the stuff ahead. By the way, um, here's an October 2010 sample of polonium-210. There's a, some cobalt-57, uh, sodium-22. 
more um, polonium 210. There's one on here that I don't want you to use. And um, oh, it's this strontium 90. Uh, don't use that. It's got such a long half life that um, it just doesn't show much of a slope on the, uh, the curve. And I don't know that you're going to get a, a decent data thing for it. So use one of the polonium 210s or the uh, sodium 22 or the cobalt 57 for your data. And you just need to do one. But I'll show you one of how we'll happen to do that thing. And let's see. Um, I don't know what page I'm on anymore. I lost track. Oh, I'm on the strontium 91. I'll go to the December 2003. Oh, that's a graph. OK, I want the data for one. So uh, counts per minute. OK, I can see down here, this is the data that I want to work with. And I'm going to take this stuff and copy that. And then I'm going to dump it over here and just put in the number values. OK, I don't know what that meant, but I don't care. Um, so I've got counts per minute, which is going to be proportional to the number of uh, particles that I happen to have. My Geiger counter will catch the same fraction of decaying nuclei every time. So that'll work. But I also want the natural log of the counts per minute. And oh, why isn't it letting me do anything here? There we go. OK. Huh. OK. There we go. Finally, I don't know what the deal was there. I'm just going to call it LN of counts for the natural log of the counts. And then right below this, my computer is acting really weird right now. Um, I want to go equals. Ln, that's the natural log function in here, of the number to the left. So have that. And I'll just drag this down. Whoops, got to finish the calculation first. Oh, rats, I accidentally put in a something or other there, underline. OK, so. This has a ridiculous number of significant figures on there. You know how to fix that, or should. And so there's the stuff we get. Now, I want to make a graph that has the days on the horizontal axis and the log of the counts on the vertical axis. I'm just going to hide this thing in the middle. And there. And now I'll make an XY graph on here. So I'll go up here, Insert a chart and to get the xy bubble chart or whatever that i want i oh i probably went too fast anyway go up here on the um insert a chart and click that xy graph and i just want a straight xy graph and you can see i've got it here and uh, let's see. I don't like little tiny graphs. I'm going to move the chart to its own page. So give it a new cheap new page. And this is if I could spell chart for January 6th lab and put that in there. And that looks like a pretty nice straight line. Now, it's missing some things I need to fix. Um, chart tools, format it. Design. Oh, where am I? 
Oh, insert. Nope, that's not what I want. I do want the chart tools and I want to, oh, add chart element. It's under format. I just didn't see it before. I want to give axis titles. I'll start off with a primary horizontal axis and it's got an axis title down here. I'm going to, the horizontal axis is days beyond first count. And that has units of days, oddly enough. Okay, and then I'll add a vertical axis. Uh, let's see, primary vertical. Um, now, what I'm actually graphing is the natural log of the counts per minute, but it's proportional to just the number of radioactive nuclei that I happen to have. So that's good. Now I've got a nice straight line here. You could print this off and figure out the slope of it, but for this lab, we're gonna let Excel do the work. And if I point at one of the data points and right click, one of the things that shows up here is add trend line and uh, then a little option shows up over here on the right side, and it's got stuff like, I want to display the equation on the chart. And all of a sudden, this equation shows up, and it may look kind of familiar. It's y equals negative something times x plus a constant. That's actually y equals mx plus b is what it happens to have. But we did not graph x's and y's, and so I need to fix that equation. And what I'm going to do is select this thing, go to my home page. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, edit these things when it's in a small font. And right now it's in a nine point font. I'm going to make it a 28 point font for the time being. And move this thing over somewhere where I can get at it. Well, I'm not graphing y. I'm graphing the natural log of the counts per minute, which I'm going to call L. And I'll just call it that. And then the slope of the graph is going to be days to the minus 1. And so after that number minus 0.0048, I'm going to put D-A-Y-S and let's see, I'm going to put a space in so I don't foul things up. Sometimes that'll happen. Uh, whoops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Let's see if I can put a superscript on this. It may not work, but sometimes it does. Yeah, days to the minus one. And back up here, put in a okay, days to the minus one. Now I don't have X on the horizontal axis, I have T. And so now I've got this thing expressed in units that kind of makes sense. Uh, something I'm not happy with is uh, the number of significant figures on this slope. And I'm not positive that I can do anything with that. You can experiment with it. If you figure out a way to show more significant figures on that number, you're welcome to and share it with people if you do happen to figure that out. But at any rate, um, there's a decent slope. And uh, something that I can do now is select this whole thing and knock it down to something more reasonable font size wise. Um, if I just make it maybe 14, how's that look? That's okay. It's big enough to still be readable when you print it off, but it's, um, it's not so tiny that you can't edit it. Now, that minus 0 0.0048 days to the minus one, 
that is lambda. And so you can use that to figure out the half-life of your radioactive isotope. Um, please don't use the same data that I just did when you do your experiment. There's several uh, data tables in this graph for you to, uh, to use that several of them that are polonium 210. So actually I would give the graph a better title and I'd call it uh, something like um, decay of polonium 210. And just like that. Okay, we've got a decent graph. Um, that's pretty much what I want you to know for this lab and uh, may be able to talk about it a little bit more, but uh, that's your procedure for this lab. And I'd like you to do a write-up on this one, um, start to finish. You can see that uh, the data points aren't all perfectly on a line and your half-life isn't probably going to come out exactly what you would want it to. I'll be talking about this some more, but I want to stop this recording so I can get it posted by shortly after three and uh, we'll be able to go with that. So um, this should be enough to get you started on the lab and uh, we can talk about this some more in the upcoming days. So I'll stop our recording here and get this thing